Hi everybody, I'm Toby, and I'm a GNOME person, as you can see, and you're here in the GNOME talk. Like in case uh, you wanted to go uh, anywhere else, uh, now is your final chance to sort of uh, find the right room. Otherwise, I'm happy to entertain you for the next 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how much uh, we engage. I'm very happy to engage, so in case you have uh, sort of any question, or in case you you know, want to discuss anything, or if there's anything unclear, or you don't understand uh, me very, very well, then please, you know, make yourself heard, and uh, we get these things sorted out. Is there anybody uh, not understanding German? Is everybody speaking and understanding German well? You're, like, raising your hand. Does that mean that you are speaking German, or that you are not speaking German? I speak German. All right. <laughs> so... <laughs> Good. <laughs> so does that mean we can actually proceed in German? Okay. Dann machen wir das so. Ja, gut. Äh, ich bin Tobi von GNOME, habe ich alles schon gesagt. Ähm, ich möchte ein bisschen vorstellen, was das GNOME-Projekt naja, so macht und wie das GNOME-Projekt denkt und wie ich glaube, dass das GNOME-Projekt naja, dafür sorgt, dass wir in der Zukunft ein, ein sichereres Computing haben. Und ich glaube, ähm, naja, dass GNOME ein, in einer sehr guten Lage dazu ist, uns ein sichereres Computing-Environment zu bringen. Und ich möchte euch auch ein bisschen davon überzeugen, dass naja, GNOME so ein Projekt ist, was sich darum kümmert und äh, was das in meiner, meiner Meinung nach auch gut macht. Dazu habe ich äh, ein paar Case Studies mitgebracht. Ich habe ein paar Beispiele, die äh, zeigen sollen, dass GNOME eben engagiert ist in dem Bereich. Und die möchte ich so ein bisschen nacheinander vorstellen und die klappern wir so nacheinander ab. Also, dass ihr das im Hinterkopf behaltet, dass wir drei äh, Sachen quasi äh, sehen werden, die ich vorstellen werde. Und äh, ja, ich werde... Damit beginnen, ein bisschen äh, was Grundsätzliches zu GNOME zu sagen. Ähm, das GNOME-Projekt hat sich ähm, einige Sachen auf die Fahnen geschrieben, ähm, für, für die es steht und, und für die es nachhaltig steht. Und ich glaube, ein zentraler Punkt dieser, dieser Prinzipien, dieser, dieser Grundwerte von GNOME, ist es, Software für möglichst viele Menschen zu schreiben. Und äh, dafür zu sorgen, dass möglichst viele Menschen in der Lage sind, GNOME-Software zu benutzen, um möglichst naja, vielen Menschen äh, es zu erlauben, ihr Computing zu betreiben. Und ähm, die, ein, eine Erweiterung dieses, dieses Begriffes ist, dass äh, sich das GNOME-Projekt äh, GNOME die Verantwortung für die User Experience in die Hand nimmt. Das ist jetzt so ein, ja, ein bisschen ein abstrakter Begriff. Also was, was heißt das schon, User Experience? Das ähm, soll sowas heißen wie, dass der dass, äh, GNOME oder dass die Software als solches dem Benutzer nicht im Weg steht bei seinen Aufgaben. GNOME, äh, das GNOME-Projekt glaubt, dass die Leute ihren Computer benutzen, dass die Leute das Computing machen, weil sie einen Job zu erledigen haben und nicht, weil sie gerne vom Computer sitzen. Also die, das ganze Mindset dreht sich immer irgendwie darum, ähm, welche Aufgabe hat der Benutzer potenziell, wenn, es, wenn er seinen oder, oder ihren Computer benutzt und wie kann, äh, wie kann man es schaffen, dass diese Aufgabe möglichst schmerzfrei und schnell äh, zu erledigen ist. Und ähm, vor diesem Hintergrund äh, macht, äh, passieren im GNOME-Projekt so einige Dinge, die ich denke, erfolgreichsten davon sind die Übersetzung. Also GNOME möchte möglichst viele Menschen dazu in die Lage versetzen, ihr Computing zu betreiben, ihr Computing mit freier Software zu betreiben. Und dazu hat das GNOME gesagt, all right, I should probably switch back to English then. It's, uh, that's no problem at all. I was actually initially offering like, to uh, continue in English and then, but no problem. Then we continue in English. Uh, that's uh, perfect. Uh, absolutely no problem. And uh, so there's many things happening in GNOME, and one of the more successful things, I think, is the whole story around uh, uh, the language issues involved with people not necessarily speaking English. We, in GNOME, we have a, 
quite successful translation story. When there's a new GNOME release upcoming, we have many, many languages being, trans uh, we, have, we have the GNOME software being translated in many, many languages in relatively short time. And this is, uh, this is not only a single, uh, this, is not ha this does not only happen a single time, but has happened over the last, I don't know, eight years or so with, with GNOME software, that we have uh, constant efforts in enabling, well, also non-English speaking people to use, uh, well, to do their computing with free software and especially with GNOME. We also try to be inclusive. You know, the, the keyword I had uh, two slides ago was inclusiveness. We extend this term, or we also understand in this, uh, in this term that we enable people who have different, say, physical needs. So we try to make GNOME as uh, usable as possible in the sense that we uh, try to make it easy for people who have different, say, uh, who have needs for different, say, input methods or different reading methods, who uh, people who cannot necessarily, you know, read a regular screen because they have some uh, physical uh, challenges to deal with uh, that, well, requires, say, dedicated hardware or, uh, say, color tinting of the screen, these things. We try to think of uh, these, well, issues and we, we try to make software which enables as many people as possible to use, well, free software. And we take, again, we take responsibility for the user experience for the whole system. We try to remove issues, say, uh, in the stack and do not paper around, you know, bugs. That is, uh, that's becoming visible when we're dealing with things like, say, Bluetooth or with graphic stuff. We don't just, you know, stop at our, say, uh, relatively high level boundary of being like uh, in user space and being the software that draws some icons in Windows. If necessary, we dig deep down um, in the stack and fix things as deep as uh, in the kernel. So we want to be as inclusive as possible, as I've said. This is one of the core things that drives GNOME. The other thing that drives GNOME is freedom. Now freedom is a, freedom, the term in itself is quite abstract. But the G in GNOME is GNU, right? And the GNU project is the, well, godfather, if you, if you will, uh, of free software. And uh, as we are on the, on the letters of GNOME, does anybody know what GNOME actually stands for, the acronym? It's a couple of letters, right? Does anybody? No, by any chance? GNU Network Object Model Exactly, yes. GNU Network Object Model Environment, GNOME, G-N-O-M-E, right? And as I've said, the G yeah, in GNOME is, uh, is GNU. And uh, so we, of course, uh, are dedicated to software freedom. And software freedom for us uh, essentially means the four core freedoms. Does anybody? I uh, know the four core freedoms that free software is about. Throw in some guesses. Freedom to use. That's freedom number zero, yes, the freedom to use. Okay. Yes, that's actually two. Uh, the freedom to you know, share with your neighbors, to help your neighbors, and the freedom to improve. And there's like another freedom, sort of a prerequisite for these. Freedom number one. <laughs> sort of, yes, in order to do that, you have to understand the software. You have, to, you have to be able to study how the software actually works. So these are the software freedoms that GNOME is uh, concerned about also. But there's yet another freedom, or I claim there's another freedom. I claim there's the freedom of you uh, being able to use your computer without you know, risking of being compromised without you having to be concerned about your communication to be, well, wiretapped into. You want to, you know, do your task on your computer without having to fear that, I don't know, bad things will happen. And um, I think the GNOME project, or we at GNOME, we are in a good position to enable these, or to, to deliver uh, these expectations, or on these expectations. Because it, as it turns out, that filtering out of external information is one of the basic functions of consciousness, according to Barry Schwartz, an, an American uh, psychologist. And uh, I think we at GNOME, 
we are quite good at concentrating on the, say, necessary things and sort of uh, highlighting the things that are, you know, important and making the other things less, say, visible or intrusive. The, as I've mentioned in the, in, in the beginning, we try to, you know, enable people to do their tasks, to make the software that does not stand in your way of, you know, you being successful in performing whatever you set out to do in your, in your com or with your computing. So we shall try to make decisions, you know, you, for you as the user as easy as possible. And we should try to focus on things that are necessary indeed and do not, say, show things that are maybe not so necessary. And regarding the security of your system, or if you translate that mindset to the security of your system, we end up with, you know, uh, removing, the, removing the user from the equation of the security system. Because uh, there have been studies which have shown that if you let users take decisions on security relevant questions regarding your system, you may as well roll the dice. Because the user is, uh, well, cannot comprehend uh, the, the consequences of certain security decisions. And I'm now bringing some examples of, well, these sort of decisions that I think uh, users cannot, uh, well, make, make in an informed manner in order to sort of convince you of this fact, say, and uh, to lay the foundation for our work at GNOME to make the security system sort of built in without the need of user interaction or with, with as little user interaction as possible. I'm claiming that we are seeing prompts every now and then and that prompts in general are a dubious feature or a dubious way of you know, interacting with the user. What are prompts? Prompts are these modal pop-ups that come out of nowhere that, you know, stay for as long as you click either option and that force you to take a decision just right now. Probably while you're doing stuff. You know, you're probably in the, in the middle of performing some task and then you get one of these prompts. You know, you get a modal dialogue. You cannot work around the dialogue. You have to, you know, do something with the system right now or you can't continue your work. And we think that, that these prompts, well, are not a good way of dealing, of interacting with the user. user. It, these prompts have been quite popular in a like, few years ago. It's, you don't see them so much these days anymore. Also because people have realized, people making software have realized that prompts are a cheap way of interacting with the user, but not, in a, not an effective way of, of interacting with the user. Security prompts are just plain wrong. You must not, you know, build software, security relevant software, which prompts the user. You must just not do that. And you must especially not produce prompts which make a permanent decision, you know, where the, where the effect of the user interacting with the prompt uh, is permanent, where, where, where it's not, you know, a one a one-time decision, but where the uh, answer of the, of the interaction with the user is, is being stored for, f for future interactions. And why is that? I claim that this is very bad and actually wrong because users are in the middle of performing a task and of course, you know, the user want to perform the task. So the user does everything uh, he or she can in order to get back to the task, you know, to the application to continue with their work. And my, one of my most uh, sort of beloved uh, prompt is, is this, you know. You've put, this, is, uh, this, this prompt is now showing this connection is untrusted. Do you, do you really want to continue? Do you really want to connect? And you know, the user, imagine the user. Uh, the user just opened the chat application or browser or you know, whatever is networking or is performing a network uh, connection or is opening a network connection somewhere. And I mean, the user has expressed the intent to have this application, you know, 
connect to the internet or do whatever the application wants. And of course I want to continue. Why, why on earth would I have opened the application in the first place? And now you can, well, claim, you know, there's some value to this prompt. I mean, it's not that, this, that the application developer would have thought of putting prompts you know, in random places just to annoy the user. Of course, the application developer had a uh, once, you know, to, to inform the user of the connection being somewhat dodgy, at least. And, you know, how do you handle this situation? Well, the, the cheap way is to issue a prompt and then let the user decide. I think we must not do that. I think we must, well, in this very case, I think we must just terminate the connection or maybe offer a settings uh, dialog where we, where we can configure the connection and then while setting up connections, then, you know, have this sort of uh, information being uh, processed. But not, you know, when the user opens the application and potentially wants to start, you know, chatting with someone, then we get this, then we get this dialog. This is not cool because the users want to perform tasks and if we issue these prompts, then users will be interrupted in the task that they want to perform and they will potentially click continue because that's what they want to do. They want to continue. I mean, they don't want to cancel. Users rarely say, oh, I actually just in the last 20 milliseconds, I decided otherwise I do not want to open the chat application. Of course, there's um, applications which are less sort of uh, easy to handle. And the way to remove these prompts must involve researching a way to guide the user to still provide the same, say, functionality. Because as I've said, the application developer has the problem now of what to do in this situation, right? The application connects to somewhere, there's a problem, what shall the application do? It's not necessarily clear. And uh, the way to get rid of prompts is to research how to well, provide a user interface, a user experience to still allow the application to be able to decide what to do and yet uh, does not uh, disturb the user in their, in their tasks. And there's ways around that and we at GNOME, we do many of these without, hopefully without you even noticing. Another prompt that, uh, that is somewhat funny is this one. Like, this software is not signed by a trusted provider. Ooh, trusted provider, what does that even mean? The software is not signed. It's the, yet again the, the same text. And uh, do not update the package unless you really are sure that it's safe to do so. And this is so, so much information. And I claim that if you, you know, ask 100 people on the streets if they, what, what they would do if they get this dialogue, you could as well have rolled the dice in order to get a decision. I mean, ima imagine again, imagine the situation where this dialogue comes up. You're probably in your software update program or whatever. And then you have clicked update. Please update all my packages. And then you get this dialogue. And you probably know, you know how to deal with, with this situation. You probably can comprehend what's going, going on behind the scenes. But you're quite a specialized bunch of people, I have to admit. Because you've probably, uh, well, had the, the uh, fortunate opportunity of having a computer science education. You've probably heard about the you know, issues involved with uh, people manipulating your packet store and manip manipulating packets on the fly you know, when you're downloading stuff and all. But I claim that most people that we try to you know, provide with free computing do not have had this fortunate opportunity of having had a computer science education. So this is a, I think this is one of the worst prompts that we could possibly have because this, if you click now, force install, the... It doesn't even say which software it is. Right, so it's, it's like on, on, you know, this is bad on all terms, like, oh, sorry, please repeat oh, please repeat the question, yeah. So the, the uh, comment was that this prompt does not even tell you what software this is about. And yes, it's, uh, it's quite a bad problem. And it doesn't exist anymore. I mean, I have to, to admit, this is, I, I needed to pull this out of uh, historic releases because, I mean, it's 2017. We tried to improve you know, on each and every release. And if this was still live, then I, I would probably not be here because I should rather fix these things. So these uh, do not or should not exist anymore. 
Another very, uh, well, concerning dialogue is this. Albert found a new update which fixes your problem. Please run before submitting a bug. PK can't update, dash dash repo dash enable equals Fedora and so on. <laughs> okay, nice. Right, it's probably six, past six we have to go. <laughs> oh, please wait, the system is being shut down. Okay. Okay. Anlage schaltet ab. Right, there's a prompt. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So in any case, in any case if you see prompts in software, well, try to you know find a way of enabling the same functionality, like uh, still enabling the application, you know, to take the decision, but without the actual prompt. And it's a hard subject. It's not you know that there there would be a an easy way to do so, and there's no obvious way for each single prompt. But there's ways. Right. So the the chat application. Uh, well, let me roll back just just one and a half steps. There are some applications that are quite special, I think. For example, a web browser is quite special. Web browsers, because web browsers are so, uh, by now, there are, web browsers are an application platform. So it's, there's no single purpose, it's not a single purpose app. The chat application, on the other hand, is more of a limited purpose app. It only does the chat thing. And for the chat application, uh, my, recommend, my recommendation now, that sounds funny as if I was the inventor, but if you look at other chat applications, what they do is when you set up the, when you set up the accounts, then you get the sort of uh, request as to whether you want to use this sort of uh, connection information, including the certificate or not. And then in the future, if the certificate doesn't match what you set up, then the connection just doesn't you know, establish. And there's no problem. You may get something like connection error, please review your, your security settings or something. And then you, you know, get the, but without a prompt, but more like uh, an informational thing in the content area of your application. And then uh, by pressing this button, you get to the settings. And then you also know where these things are configured for the future. You know, there's, it's not a one-time thing, but you get to the general settings page where you can then set up the application. Right. Exactly. With, with a view of the user yeah. Interruption. Right. But still, it's a hard problem to, uh, to solve because the user cannot solve this problem yes. because it's a server issue. Uh, yes. So, the, the right thing would probably be to guide the user to contact the server uh, administrator or whatever, who uh, probably doesn't know that it's a significant value for expired. Maybe. It's a hard problem, yes, I, I give you that. And if there was, a, was an easy fix, we wouldn't have had prompts in first place. Yes, yes. The prompts exist because they were cheap for applications developers to do. And what I claim, what makes GNOME a bit different from other, say, environments, is that the GNOME people, well, tend to give these issues a thought, at least. And they try to come up with ways to enable you know, the, the functionality still, but without interrupting the user as badly as with a prompt. Maybe, you know, there's still the prompt, but maybe it's, uh, in that case, it probably wouldn't be as bad or as severe as these prompts that we've seen now. You wanted to say something? Uh, in most cases, uh, so, uh, such prompts are probably configuration issues and not real uh, security fails. But uh, as uh, a security interested user, you may bother if a client uh, just uh, uh, connects uh, and uh, give a small hint, uh, because uh, there's already a man information uh, transmitter that are sensible and you couldn't uh, prevent that. So the first part that I got was that most of these things are configuration issues, not necessarily security problems per se. And the second part was too long for me to comprehend. 
because it's quite late and uh, it's, uh, the last slot of the conference. It's been uh, it's been an amazing uh, uh, 20 hours or so of conference, and I'm uh, quite drained by now, also mentally. So, please uh, repeat. Um, uh, you said uh, you suggest uh, the the chat app to just. Uh, reconnect uh, even if the certificate changed and uh, give the user a small hint that it changed. Ah, so um, the comment was that I was recommending the chat, applica chat application to connect anyways if the certificate changed, but that's not what I meant at least. I hope it's also not what I said. I said the connection should not be established in any case. Ah. Just not. You, know, you, you, just not co you just not connect. I mean, you just don't because it's not what you set up before. The chat application would probably ask you to set up your credentials in first place, you know, in uh, the sort of initial uh, setup phase, yeah. and then. In, uh, in Let's Encrypt, for example, uh, it's normal that certificate changes frequently. Right, and in Let's Encrypt, it's also normal that you have, you know, uh, a common uh, root certificate, an intermediary, which always stays the same. And I mean. If we are talking TLS, then you probably have a TLS credential store, and we should, of course, make use of that. The problem in 2017 still is that these uh, credential stores, these uh, root CA stores, are a bit messed up. We have in GNU Linux, we have no unified way of managing these. But again, GNOME is, uh, is working on that. There is P11 Glue, uh, P11 Kit, which has like some uh, glue code to unify these credential stores, because you have several. You have uh, OpenSSL has their own stuff in somewhere in Etsy, SSL somewhere. You have uh, Firefox, which has their own stuff. You have uh, potentially Thunderbird, which I think has their own uh, root uh, store still. And you have uh, probably various other apps who ship their own, pardon me? Java. Java, exactly. Java has their own key store as well. And you have all these, well, ecosystems, which, which uh, ship their own X509 stores for no good reason, really, other than that nobody sat down and like worked on unifying that. And again, GNOME is, uh, I think, one of the few people, also the Fedora guys have an interest in having that unified. But uh, uh, GNOME is one of the, is involved in getting this sort of fixed and cleaned up. And this, again, I attribute this to GNOME being concerned about the user experience uh, and goes down the stack if necessary, this one instance. So yeah, it's, uh, it's not an easy, these are not easy issues. And again, uh, we need to think about that. And again, um, I think GNOME is uh, one project who does, well, make efforts in thinking about these. Please. So how does it work? How, how does GNOME approach the developer of this application to uh, improve uh, the user experience? Ah, so how does that work? How does GNOME, like, prod the application developers to because make things better. That's what he came up with because he had no better idea. Right. So the easy answer is, well, it's GNOME applications. GNOME just fixes it. I mean, yeah. that's the ideal case. The, the GNOME desktop, usually when I give this talk, I, make, I spend at least five minutes in asking the people, you know, what do you think is GNOME and what, you know, does GNOME involve and everything. And then we sort of uh, make straight that GNOME is a desktop environment. That's what people, you know, come up with relatively easily. But then, what does it mean? You know, people. Then, then it's uh, then, it gets bit, then it gets a bit tougher. GNOME is also a set of applications, and we ship. I forgot the exact number, but it's a uh, it's a relatively large number of applications that we have under our control, and that we want distributions to ship along, or that they ship with what they call GNOME. And we hope that you know, if you install GNOME, that you get a nice and working and fully sort of suited environment to do your computation. Of course, uh, if it's third party applications, then I mean, at the end of the day, we are out of the game. We, we can only suggest fixes. And if you know, nobody accepts them, then people do. As I, I'm not entirely sure, like in the chat application, uh, regarding things like chat applications. But what I know is that uh, we are concerned with the GNOME forks, you know, the Mate and Cinnamon, all, all of them for have uh, forked the GNOME code and uh, are sort of uh, changing some strings to not show events, but I forgot the name of the other apps. And if we have fixes, important fixes on our end, we go the extra mile and, you know, inform the other projects and create pull requests for these important fixes. So we do that to the limited extent that we are sort of capable of doing. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you are trying to communicate with someone over chat, then you need to do whatever it takes uh, to continue anyway. So it doesn't matter if it's a prompt or if it's a configuration change. Right. You will get to it. So what's the value in not having prompt? Right. So the, the comment was, or the question was, uh, that uh, with the chat application example, uh, when the user wants to you know, chat with someone, then uh, uh, it doesn't matter much whether the user gets offered a prompt or some other way of, well, actually, Posting. right, you know, the, uh, the exact way of the, uh, how the user actually gets to connect doesn't matter because the user goes to, you know, whatever extent necessary to make the connection happen. That's sort of the comment. So what's the value in not having prompts? So that's a, that's a good question. And the uh, one thing is that in the chat application thing, you might be tempted as an application developer to have this permanent decision thing. If you don't offer this permanent decision in the first place, then you, well, do not risk that the, well, user forgets about, or that the user has a chance of reversing the decision in case the user realizes that it was a bad decision, you see. Of course, uh, you get the same effect still with the, revised user interaction. I mean, if, if the user sets up a bad connection, then the connection is bad, sure. But hopefully in the process of doing so, the user also gets to learn how to, well, set it up correctly, you know, in the future in case the user realizes, oh, I've set up the connection wrongly, now everybody can read my data. This is, uh, well, if you let the user do that, if you give the user to op the opportunity to do that correctly, then the chances are higher that the user will do it correctly. See. With the prompt, there, there's no way you can do you can answer the prompt you know in a good way because if you select no cancel, then it's not good because the user cannot chat. If you let the user select yes, then it's bad because uh, everybody can read the data. So there's, there's the prompts. There, there's no good thing about the prompts other than that it's cheap for the application developer to do. With the alternative way, I mean it's it's not 100% good, but it's at least a little bit better in the sense that it's the maybe the proper way of setting up a connection and the user can undo the wrong thing that the user did before. But uh, I don't claim there is you know, the best way of handling the things. I'm claiming though that we have better ways than the prompts. And the alternative, alternative way of, uh, in the chat application example, I think is a little bit better because you know, the user learns how to undo things, the user learns how to uh, do things once and then they're valid instead of they're valid sometimes and sometimes they're not valid when I click cancel or okay or so. It's also, I think mentally it's a bit easier to comprehend that the things that, are, that I have in the setting thing are valid. Whereas with the prompt thing, the things in my settings dialog are only valid sometimes. Okay, so um, there is another inherent say law or it's attributed to, to Ellison uh, from some Usenix conference from 20 years ago. And this law says that for every click or keystroke required for a security feature, your user base declines by half. So if we, you know, make the user do something actively in order for the security to be there, then, well, our system is not as good as if the security was there without the user having to do anything. So we should try to, you know, have built systems which require as little interaction but are still secure, whatever secure means in this context. So these are the sort of, uh, this is the mindset where we are coming from in the GNOME project in general. And now I've, I've promised I'm bringing some case studies. I'm bringing some examples of how I think uh, we do that. And one example is this. Does anybody know what these people are doing? Has anybody ever seen that? It's like a bunch of people standing around. They're like having some uh, sheets of paper and everything. Has anybody ever seen that? It's a key signing party. A what? Key signing party. It's a key signing party. What is a key signing party? It sounds fun. It is. <laughs> so what is a key signing party? Um, well, they share their keys and they uh -huh. Right, so 
so the comment was that these people share the keys so that in like after the fact they can communicate securely. They're building the rebel trust. trust, very correct. So you too. But you assign keys after the talk? Uh, I do. You can use this fingerprint because this is uh, what people do. They utter fingerprints to each other. These are 160 bits of information, and these people, in the worst case, they're like uttering these uh, bits of information uh, like towards each other. And these are uh, 240 people were in this uh, like in this queue in, in this queue. And um, this is the typical format of what people deal with. Like this is a hexadecimal string, 160 bits of information, the SHA-1 hash of the open PGP key. And people read this out to each other and then they claim to verify identities and all. And uh, so you've taken part, you've participated in a key signing party. What do you do like after you've stood for three hours in uh, Brussels in January because it's fast in time and it's minus two degrees and it's snowing and you get home with your cold and cough. What, what do you do then? You, you put it in, a, in, in, in your uh, key store so you can yeah, use the new information. All right. So, all right. So you put it in your key store. So you read you know, this hexadecimal data of your piece of paper. You're not sure you know, if you're reading a B or an A or something. And then you transfer the data to your key store, you say, and then you eventually produce signatures, right? And how do you produce signatures? You probably use CAF. CAF is like the tool to use, you know, when you're producing signatures. This is the pinnacle. This is the gold standard as of now. You know, if you're, it doesn't get any better than using CAF. And CAF is a Perl program. There's nothing wrong with Perl. I mean, people like it or dislike it, doesn't matter much. And in order to configure CAF, you know, you write raw Perl. So if I wanted to use CAF with my parents, say I you know, not only need to ship a book about OpenPGP and security and everything, I also need to ship a book about Perl because my parents would need to learn Perl in the first place before they are able to you know, do the whole key signing stuff. And you could think, if you're mean, that there's like a big conspiracy around this whole OpenPGP security thing because we're using all this uh, weird stuff like Base 16. Because I haven't even asked you, what, what do you think? Uh, I do that because it's a bit fun. How do you think you can communicate 160 bits of information in the least efficient way possible? You know, you have 160 bits of information on your piece of paper, and you want to get that across, you know, by uttering something. How do you get 160 bits of information across in the least efficient way possible? What, what would you do? Binary. Binary, right? You would use base 2 encoding of the data. And then what do you think is the second least efficient way? of transferring 160 bits of information via utterances. Base 4. Well, base 4, you could do that. You could, you know, base 3, base 4 and all. <laughs> Nobody does that. Base 8 would probably be, you know, the next one. But it's also a bit weird. The next thing would be base 16. You know, it's, uh, it's quite an inconvenient way of, you know, sharing this information, but yet people somehow like it and all. And we have this, I, oh, I get into ranting, it's, uh, I get excited, that's not so good. We have uh, like uh, loads of problems with the whole infrastructure around because how do you get the, how do you put the key into your key store in first place? Right, you go to the internet and get the key, right? Because how else would you obtain the copy of the key? And where do you get the key from? From a key server, right? The key servers are written in OCaml. I know quite a bunch of people, like, I don't know. Um, I've been around the free software community like for a long time and I know many people who do programming and all. Yet, I know exactly three person, three people, I mean, uh, knowing how to program an OCaml. It's this weird French dialect from the mid 1600s that like by now only three people are being are able to write programs in. So we have this, everything is a bit weird around this whole crypto, crypto stuff. And I claim it's a little bit due to the fact that these security people, they mostly are concerned with themselves. Which is fine, you know. Free software people usually scratch their own itch and it's a perfectly valid reason, you know, to develop software. But I think we'd be living in a better world if we targeted, say, my parents for, you know, using the security things. And uh, again, I think GNOME is a good, you know, GNOME has a good mindset to actually deliver on that. And I'll, I'll quickly show some examples of how I think we could make things better regarding this whole key signing mess, if you will. So how about, how about we have an interface that say, allows you to select your own key, you know, you get a list of your keys, and eventually you select one, and then you get some machine readable information that you can use with the other party who actually wants to sign your key. 
that other party would eventually, you know, make use of the machine readable information. Then somehow the application would make sure that the key is being transferred in an authentic way so that nobody could have tampered with the key in transit. And then maybe, you know, all it takes is a click of a button and the key is signed. Wouldn't that be awesome? Turns out you can do that already now, more or less, with the application don't key sign. And I think it's a I think it shows how you can, you know, make things better that have been the way they are for 20 or more years, you know, with just the mindset of trying to be not intrusive without, or with trying to be as inclusive as possible, with trying to enable as many people as possible to make use of the, in this case, security system. I've brought a video, but uh, let's skip, uh, skip that and uh, go to something, talk about something that's much more exciting, uh, containerization of applications. We have uh, all the rage now about uh, Docker and images, and now is uh, people talk about Snappy and Flatpak and uh, App Image, and uh, we do that too. So we have uh, in the GNOME project we have uh, concerned ourselves with the question of how do we confine applications so that they cannot do harm in case they are being exploited. You know to be able to mitigate effects of a compromise. And now you, you might say, oh, well, just use Docker, right? Because uh, Docker has been around for, what, three years or something now, or four by now? And, you know, just use that for your application, bundle up everything in, in one of those uh, images, and then you're good to go. You might be able to do that, but you quickly run into problems if you're wanting to do desktop applications, you know, not as opposed to server-side applications that get along without any interaction. If you're having desktop applications, it's likely that it needs to interact with, you know, not only the system itself, but also with the periphery, like with your printer or with your, I don't know, your sound card or with your camera or something. So you cannot just use, you know, any existing containerization technology because you will need to interact with the rest of your environment somehow or it's relatively likely that if you're building a desktop system that you will need to interact with other parts of not only the system but also your environment. So we have Flatpak. Flatpak is a new way of distributing applications in GNU Linux. So we are, uh, say, not limited to all Linux systems running AppArmor, for example. Uh, Flatpak is only used by Right, so the question was whether Flatpak is only usable in Fedora, and the answer is no. It's not, say, snappy where you need this app ammo module in order for it to work properly. Flatpak is a, a technology which basically ships your image. Flatpak itself is uh, only a cool way of distributing your OS free images. So actually, Flatpak itself doesn't even do that itself. You know, it doesn't even distribute the image itself. Flatpak only uh, calls or makes use of, of OS tree in order to ship the data, you know, from the server, for example, to your machine in order, well, uh, for the application to then live on your machine rather than, you know, on the internet. It also doesn't, Flatpak also doesn't do sandboxing itself because it uses bubble wrap for that. Bubble wrap is uh, a project which creates a sandbox, a confined environment, where the applications uh, can live in and where they can hopefully, uh, well, uh, not cause any, any harm for the host system. And uh, what Flatpak essentially does is it connects you, it, it connects all those bits and pieces and gives you a application delivery mechanism, a, an ecosystem where you can uh, make your application where you can bundle up your application and have it uh, have users download this application conveniently. So the security properties of uh, Flatpak are coming from bubble wrap as I've said. Bubble wrap is a Linux tool. It makes use of Linux. So any Linux you have, the Linux program, the Linux kernel, uh, you can use with bubble wrap. And Bubble Wrap makes use of all these modern, nice, and fancy kernel features like namespaces, cgroups, and seccom. 
basically what you have is a change root. That's the like very old traditional security feature of Linux where you can confine a process to a certain directory on your uh, file system basically. And, uh, but it, it is change root on steroids. It uses all these other fancy things to, uh, well, uh, to make it more secure still, but also to enable you to punch holes in, in two or through the sandbox. So the sandboxing facilities is what I call the classic security features. You know, this is, these are classic, classical Linux ways to confine processes, well, in order to limit them in their potential harm that they could do. You know, by bind mounting stuff read only into the namespace, you prevent things, uh, you prevent the application from being able to overwrite data. By not mounting things into the namespace, you prevent the application from being able to read data well out of the system. By uh, using C groups, you prevent the application from hogging all your resources. These are all relatively classic ways of making things more secure. And Flatpak, you know, uses all that conveniently without you having to care about any of this, any of these things. Yet, uh, I've said something like, well, you need to interact with your environment because that's probably what uh, desktop applications do. So you can punch holes through the sandbox. You can, you know, interact with your, say, X server, with your audio daemon, with your dbus. You can do all these things by punching holes through the sandbox uh, with, you know, uh, with uh, bubble wrap. You can uh, give it certain arguments and it'll allow you to do stuff that you were not able to do by default. By default, if you call bubble wrap, you get the most restrictive environment possible, and uh, you may want to open up the sandbox in order for you to be able to interact with the, with the rest of the system. You might want to complement that, though, with uh, a more modern approach to security, which, well, we call portals. These portals are interactive means to, uh, to get to know the intent of the user. Because I think this is one of the, the core features of these um, modern security solutions. Uh, um, the, the core thing is to get to know the, atten the intent of the user. You know, you need to uh, find out what the user actually wanted to do. You know, if I open the, the chat application, it's relatively reasonable that I want to start chatting now. So, you know, as you've said, the user goes to, to some extent, uh, the user tries to make it possible for the application to do exactly that. And uh, by having interactive portals, interactive uh, dialogues, prompts to some extent, we try to find out what the intent of the user was. Now, what is such a portal? Such a portal could be uh, open something with an, Jesus, open something with, a, with an application. In this case, upper left, like uh, which application do you want to you know, open this URL with? Or we have a, uh, a printing dialogue. If you press print, then you're, you're being asked, what printer do you want to use? These are all relatively classic things, right? People know these already. And we're using these mechanisms to find out what the user wanted to and then let the action, you know, uh, permit the action. So we can poke holes through the sandbox with these portals uh, to, to allow privileged operations like printing, but without surprising the user. There's no weird prompt like, do you really want to print now or something? We are reasonably sure that the user wanted you know, to print because the user selected the printer. And only then, if we select the printer, the sandbox will be, uh, will be allowing the application you know, to print the, the thing. And once the dialogue is gone, uh, the application cannot connect to the printer anymore. So we are also using these portals as a temporary mechanism to allow access. You know, compare that to, say, Docker where you can either give and grant access all the time or you cannot because you cannot dynamically adjust the permissions of the application. With this interactive model, we can do that. And I think it's good and I think it's great and I think uh, we will see much, much more, well, hype and ramblings around this technology because I do think it's great. I think it's enabling us to do things that we weren't able to do before in, uh, in a much, much more secure way. So this is the second thing. Let me quickly uh, do the third thing before we enter the, the Q&A. Uh, yeah, and then we are, we're good. So another thing that I am personally concerned with 
is uh, USB. So in my previous life, I was assessing the security of USB, and uh, I found out that the, well, just having the port open on your machine uh, opens a relatively large attack surface. Essentially, what an attacker could do is load any, pretty much any kernel driver that you have on your like machine. And if you're installing any random you know, Ubuntu or Fedora, you have every kernel driver there is on your machine. And the attacker is able to interface, to interact with, this, with any of these drivers at their will. It's quite scary if you, if you, think, about it, if you think about that. So the question, I think, uh, that drove me was, uh, when do you use your USB? And most importantly, when do you not? You know. And then, if you're not using your USB, who else uses your USB? And why are we actually allowing the USB port to work when we are not you know, even being able to use our USB because we are away? You know? When I'm locking the screen, why does my USB port work? Why? does my machine allow an attacker, or I mean, any person really, to interact with all these uh, Linux drivers when I'm not even here and touching the machine, when I'm on the toilet or anywhere else? I don't think we have a good reason for doing that. And uh, USB is an attack surface. It's uh, relatively well known that you know, if you expose your USB, then you get, well, you might have trouble. You know, it's, uh, there have been incidents uh, in the past, and there will be more incidents in the future that make use of the USB port. And I think uh, one easy fix is to, <laughs> the easiest fix is to, you know, just use some glue and, you know, fix up your USB port, and then nobody can ever, you know, plug anything in. Of course, that's not uh, where we are coming from uh, in the GNOME project. We can do that, uh, we can block and unblock the USB in software, and we would see a video if my graphics driver worked, but it doesn't, and it's uh, also not too bad. What we would see here now is um, some software which disables USB for a certain device. You know, uh, not sorry, not device. It would uh, disable USB for a certain class. Sorry, so you would not be able to uh, load any, uh, say, CD-ROM drives. You know any external media, because... Uh, especially keyboard. Especially keyboard is the comment. Especially not keyboard, I'm afraid. Because uh, you will want to allow keyboards in any case, because your keyboard might break. But that's, you know, details, again, uh, that requires you to have this, uh, this inclusiveness mindset to be able to find out what you need to allow and disallow. But there were USB uh, attacks in the past right. that uh, simulated the Right, right. So the comment was there, there were attacks uh, simulating keyboards, and that's certainly correct. That's absolutely right. Yet, from a technical perspective, these uh, attacks were quite boring. They were not you know, interfacing with any random uh, kernel driver you had. And they were only as powerful as any regular keyboard, which in itself is you know, quite bad, but if I'm on the, on the toilet and my machine is locked, then I'm fine with that. You know, they, the keyboard can... Um, the worst thing the keyboard could do is, you know, uh, go through passwords. That's already quite bad, but uh, it's not as bad as, you know, the machine being compromised because it would load the uh, file system driver for now name any ancient file system that would automatically, you know, uh, be mounted if I plugged in a pen drive and all. So, but yeah, there, there's issues around that. We, we cannot simply disable USB when the screen is blocked, although it would probably be already better than the status quo. You know, right now, if you have a machine and you plug in USB, your Linux kernel would happily load any random driver that my, uh, my fake USB device would you know, make you load, uh, make you to. And it's quite scary, actually. Can't you control how many keywords you have? Say, you know, you use right. two keywords or one Right, device. right. So the comment was, can, can you not control how many keywords you know, uh, can uh, plug in? And I say yes. It's, you can think of a solution like that. I think, it's, uh, uh, I think it's a bad solution, though. I think from, a, from the user experience uh, perspective, it's, it's hard to communicate that you can plug in two, you, you, two keyboards, but not three. It's uh, somehow difficult. You, you, could, <laughs> you could make prompts to trust the device. Right, you could make prompts to trust a device. Yes, I would not use prompts, though. I would probably 
somehow show uh, something like, oh, we've detected a new device. Do you want to make use of that? Not with a prompt, though. And then if you click, yeah, please set up my devices, then you would get your list of devices. And you could then, I don't know, swipe the, swipe the device to the, to the left or to the right if you want to make use of it or not, something like that. Or the best case, I think, is to only allow devices if you have an application started. You know, imagine, and now, and now we have the technology. Slowly we start to, to, to having this technology. With Flatpak, we have tight control over what, what applications are doing what with our environment. And why would I load a camera driver? Why would I make my Linux kernel load a camera driver if I'm not having an application open that uses the camera? You know, it's, uh, I don't think it makes much sense to have, the, to, to have my Linux kernel do that. With Flatpak, we can potentially uh, determine whether we have a, an application using the camera, and only then make the kernel use or load the camera driver. And I think we, we have uh, many more things to explore in this area. And we would uh, see some videos uh, which would show some automation around this, these things. It's uh, very experimental, though. So I've, I've shown you uh, software or ideas in various stages. I've shown you the key signing stuff, which is sort of in beta stage. You can use that already now. These uh, screenshots were not drawn. They were live. I've shown you the Flatpak stuff. It's quite production ready already. Uh, if you, you know, do apt-get install Flatpak, you get all this Flatpak stuff. You can start applications now, and you can you know, uh, do real things with Flatpak just right now. And if you develop applications, you should, you should package it up as a Flatpak and put it up on FlatHub so that other people can use your latest and greatest application as Flatpak. And I've shown you the USB stuff, which is very experimental and is a, more in a research phase. And it also allows you know, for contributors like you to engage in this sort of discussion and make this real and usable and protect users from you know, attacks via the USB port. And uh, I'm way over time already. Uh, this is also because we had a great discussion. And uh, nonetheless, I want to close it now. And of course, I'm available here. But for the internet, uh, we're closing it down. And I thank you very much for your attention.